Okay, so it's that time of the day. Let's um, let's get started. So, guys, welcome. This uh, will be our first, I guess, official class. Um, you know, as much as it can be. So, uh, get started. So, I just figured I'd um, hop over to the syllabus for just a quick second. But it decides to. I love Google Doc. Man, sometimes it takes a long time to look. There we go. Anyways, so uh, just as a note, you know, we're here Thursday, 9-3, which is kind of weird to say because, you know, it's, it feels like it still should be summer, <laughs> but it's, it's September. Um, so we're going to be covering um, a lecture today. It's going to be Welcome to the Anthropocene. So it's going to sort of set the stage for what we're talking about for the rest of the semester. Uh, there are a few readings for you available on Blackboard. So you have uh, two articles about tragedy of the commons, which we're going to discuss today, and as well as um, a podcast around strategy of the commons. And then finally, uh, we have a video um, on Blackboard called putting a value on nature, and it's going to be in the media folder. And so you should take, um, you should take a peek at these, uh, read them, uh, watch them, and we'll find a lot of good extra context because we'll discuss tragedy of the commons, but you know, this will discuss it much more frequently. Um, next Monday, we won't be meeting because it is Labor Day and we still observe uh, holidays even though we're remote. And, um, and then in terms of what else we're gonna be doing is we'll pick up again next Thursday and we'll do a little bit of a lecture and then we'll have a discussion um, on some papers. But uh, uh, just in terms of um, what you're gonna be doing, make sure you um, take a little bit of time, download the TOC module, folder in the media folder, playing and play, play around with it um, and see how things go. But that'll be before Thursday. But we'll discuss on Thursday sort of how this is going to go, um, or I guess how the tragedy of the commons exercise is going to go. Uh, usually when we do a tragedy of the commons exercise, we, uh, we do a goldfish lab where you, we all, we, you all pretend to be fishermen in the lab and you fish your goldfish and you see how well you can maintain your stock. So it's a, but not as fun as that because you don't get to eat the goldfish um, doing it virtually, but I mean, I'm sure you could buy goldfish if you so wanted goldfish. So, um, so today we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to be covering um, the Anthropocene. So this is just the part of human history and the part of the global history um, that humans have been directly involved in. And I'm sure you can pick that up from the anthro part of the Anthropocene part, anthro being human influence. So if you have any questions um, as we're going along, I'm gonna prompt you a couple times to get your opinion on something. Uh, feel free to dump that information into the chat uh, or feel free to dump it uh, just by physically saying it. Um, that's okay too. I feel like most people are more comfortable just writing it into chat overall. Um, in addition, please remember to say hi in chat so that you can get your credit for coming to class today. So don't forget just to say hi or hello or what's up um, or ask me for a picture of my dog. I don't know, anything, just say something. So, uh, so your mission for this course overall is um, to determine how you can become a better steward in the environment. And we're doing this simply by learning. I'm sure you guys have all heard the, the, you know, the term knowledge is power. Uh, and in the case of environmental science, in the case of sustainability, um, and anything really related to science, which is pretty much every topic um, in some shape or form, uh, knowledge is sort of your best uh, weapon. And so I like to start off uh, this lecture by doing a couple of different like, you know, things and showing you some things. I really uh, think this is a pretty accurate description of sort of the evolution of life, um, at least in terms of how, you know, humans are involved. We started off in the ocean and we moved out into the ocean into primates and some sort of human ancestor. And eventually we're at the point now where we are either directly or indirectly dumping large parts of our waste into the ocean. And it's really coming full circle, right? We're coming back around to the, to the ocean. Um, not in a good way, but we are ultimately coming back into the ocean. And this idea of waste and this idea of how we treat the environment is really the core of this class. Um, how humans are impacting the environment, what are some major things that we're doing to the environment, what can we do to improve the environment, what can we do to improve ourselves. And again, this is all done by simply becoming better steward, becoming more aware of the science. So um, I like to sort of preface this um, class by asking you guys, what do you think all living things on this planet, large or small, um, do or all characteristics we all share in common. So when I say all living things, I mean the smallest things, the bacteria and the viruses, all the way up to um, the whales and humans and all the big things. So what characteristics do you think all life shares on this planet? There's no right or wrong answer here, but it's maybe it's not something you've really thought about in the past. So what do you guys think? Uh, 
Instead, you can dump it in the chat. Um, so everything has to breathe in some way, shape, or form. That's true. And breathing is, um, we're respiring, right? So we're processing energy. Yep. Um, we all grow. That is true. Everything grows. Everything has to eat. That's directly tied to breathing. We're all made up of cells. That's very true. Either one cell or many, many cells. Uh, we all reproduce. That is very true. Reproduction is the best, the uh, only thing that life really needs to do. Um, that's kind of what life is for. Uh, we also all take up space. That is true. Some of us take up more space than others. Um, so those are all good things. Anybody else have any thoughts? You guys are much more awake than my eight o'clock class this morning. <laughs> so, ability to think. That's an interesting one. Um, I guess it depends on how you define thinking. Right? Is it just what humans do? Or is it what mammals do? Is it sensing? That's, a, that's an interesting, that's a broad topic of thinking, intelligence. It's a, it's a really good uh, thing, Mark. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if that's a shared characteristic because some people don't think plants can think, but they certainly can sense the environment and respond to it. So it just depends. But in terms of life, um, we all have, again, big and small, all share the capacity to, as we discussed, to grow and develop, interact and respond to the environment. And this, this second one is really important for um, environmental science because so much of what we're observing in terms of changes um, that are induced by humans are all changes how inter organisms interact and respond to their environment. Um, as we discussed, everything reproduces and processes energy. Everything has the capacity to self-regulate. And what I mean by that is like, um, I'm hot, therefore I sweat, and that cools me down. So that's what we mean by self-regulation. Uh, everything is ordered and organized. I know things might seem random at times, um, but when you look at a flower, there's a higher level of organization to the structure of that flower. It's not random. Things are laid out um, in a very specific way. And that's pretty much true of all characteristics of life. It's pretty ordered. Nothing is kind of random. Um, and then finally, everything has the capacity to evolve and adapt. And we'll touch upon this idea of evolution and adaptation as well later in the semester because how organisms adapt, oops, how organisms adapt to the environment um, is important for th how things are going to be changing going forward. So these are all the seven characteristics that life shares, big and small, uh, single cellular or multicellular. So um, next up sort of on our trip here is um, this clock. And so for some reason, this, um, this got cut off, I'm not sure why, um, but this says first reptiles or first amphibians. Everything says basically first. <laughs> Um, so we have a clock in one, and this is the 4.6 billion years of this planet, and each, and this is just represented by one hour. So we, at time of the Earth started at zero seconds, uh, the Earth's crust formed at one, you know, one second, and then things have moved on through the hour. Um, what's remarkable about this clock to you guys? There's a couple of things I always pick up, but what, when you look at this, what is remarkable to you? Can we freely talk or do you want us to say that again? Can we can we talk or do you want us to like say it in chat? You can say it in chat or you can talk. Either is fine. Okay. Um I mean for me it seems that all life happens to all life that we know like significant, you know, not to say that bacteria isn't significant, but if you look at all the main events that comes to that culminates to human life has happened in the last four hours. Um, yeah, which is pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, no, um, yeah, no. Everything, all the all the major things, you know, plants, animals, all the stuff is happening like in the past, like you know, qu half an hour or quarter of an hour here, right? So everything is really catnated. All the big stuff took a really long time to evolve. That's a really great point. Anyone have else? Anyone else sort of see a couple other things? Yeah, I would just say like the space at the beginning where like all of the development of the earth itself, how long that took in comparison to how quickly um, life developed afterwards. Sure. I mean, that's, um, you know, if you look at sort of this, the crust forms and there's enough at zero seconds, basically, and you infer the origin of life at, you know, 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes of nothing. But, you know, for most of our 4. Billion, 6 billion years, there's mostly life, right? Which I think is pretty remarkable. Anything else? Uh, 
a thing I always like is that inferred origin life and first bacteria is that's that's what we're they're sort of connected right the first the first type of life would have been microbial so microbes were on this planet by themselves for about 40 minutes before anything larger developed which is a long time right most of our history is microbial and then the final thing i like to point out is this the end point right we think about the ice age in the first modern man that's in the last the closing seconds of this hour so man has been around for a very, very, very low minute amount of time. And it's kind of amazing how much of an effect we've had on the planet in such a short period of time. So um, in terms of the Earth's origin, it's, you know, the universe itself is about 13 billion years old. As I mentioned, the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. Um, and there's, there's supporting evidence for this. Um, if you're interested in more of this, I can pass on some information. But this is how we know. Um, and there are some models that suggest that Earth is 6 billion years ago, but it's kind of, uh, those aren't, are less well supported than the sort of evidence we have here. So, um, and in terms of how life started, we don't really quite know. This is sort of one of the, the greatest questions of biology. Um, there's several models and theories to explain how life arose on this planet. You know, something as simple, uh, sim as complex as like, you know, spontaneous generation of um, life through chemical reactions, or something as less crazy as panspermia or exogenesis, which is would be, you know, life came here from another planet. And there's lots and lots of hypotheses and, and theories out there as how life got started. Um, and the, but that would be a whole class on itself because there's a lot of them. But just to know, there's no quite uh, definitive explanation right now for how life arose on this planet. Lots of evidence. Not really sure what's going on overall. But again, uh, the remarkable part of this clock that we're going to discuss today is this very last closing seconds of our hour, um, the last minute of this hour, and that is the part of the human time, uh, part of the Earth's history that is directly controlled by humans. And this is what we collectively call as the Anthropocene. And so the Anthropocene is simply the, the period of time on this planet, uh, the geological epoch that uh, is defined by the presence of humans or human ancestors. I've mentioned this before, but no other organism on this planet quite changes the planet the way humans do. Microbes do it. Um, they do a pretty good job at changing the planet, as do plants, as do insects, but nothing quite does it to the degree at which humans do. None of those have the capacity um, in the short period of time that humans have to change the planet so dramatically. So um, the earliest sort of, um, just as a sort of a, you know, history lesson about um, the evolution of man, the earliest human ancestors seem to have originated between six and seven million years ago. Um, this is all happening in Africa at the time. Um, our most, essentially most distant relative that we know of is a, uh, you know, primate looking guy, Homo habilis and uh, Homo erectus, which is about two million years ago. Um, modern Homo sapiens really came to be around 200,000 years ago in that ballpark. Estimates vary, but it's about 200,000 years ago. And about 100,000 years ago, we started migrating out of Africa into Europe, into, into the Middle East, into Asia, and then um, more recently making it into the Americas. Though there is um, some interesting data to suggest that maybe we settled the Americas much sooner than 15, um, uh, much earlier than 15,000 uh, years ago, maybe closer to 25 or 30,000 years ago. But that's, that's beyond the point. But ultimately, uh, all biological evidence points to the start of the human race in Africa and then expansion of the human race out of Africa, colonizing the planet as a whole. Now, you might ask yourself, why the heck did I just go through that? Well, it's important to think, right? It's important to think about time scales, right? If we think about the settlization, the settling of Europe, right, at 40,000 years ago, that's not that long ago relative to sort of the history of the planet, right? We're talking in the history of the planet's billions years ago. But now we're talking about a few thousand years ago. But this movement of humans, the sort of the evolution of humans as a population is again defined as the Anthropocene. This is the time by which humans have ruled the planet. And the technical definition for this is Earth's most recent geological time period as being human influence or anthropogenic based on overwhelming global evidence that atmospheric, geological, hydrologic, and biospheric, and other Earth system processes are now altered by humans. And I think it's important to, to note this sort of definition. And all these things are huge, 
changing the atmosphere, changing geology, changing hydrology, changing the biosphere, those are huge events. That's not a minor thing to accomplish. And that's why I say nothing quite does it like humans. To alter these things takes other species thousands and millions of years to do. We do it on very short time scales, which is absolutely amazing. And the second thing about this sort of thing is the Anthropocene, again, is defined by the human ruling of the planet. And that really started when we became a species. That started around that 200,000 years ago, because we might not have been altering the atmosphere or the geology 200,000 years ago, but we were certainly altering the biosphere and we were definitely altering the hydrology of this planet. So since day one, we've been, um, well, for better or worse, uh, <laughs> taking names and kicking butt. That's just sort of what we do as a sort of normal species. So um, as a term, this is actually a pretty popular scientific term, um, geologically speaking. So if you talk to um, the chair of the natural sciences department, he'll call it the Holocene because he's a geologist. Um, and that, that Holocene started about 11,000 years or about 12,000 years ago now after the last ice age. Um, but uh, just, just as a note, like technical terms of what we're technically in is called is the Holocene, but people like to talk about it as the Anthropocene because again, humans are so destructive. Now, as I mentioned, humans have always influenced the environment. This is since day one. And we can see this by looking at the fossil record. So we can look at the extinction of megafauna, um, you know, 50,000 to 11,000 years ago, um, like largely due to overhunting. So we know large species like the giant sloth, the woolly mammoth, saber-toothed tiger, all went extinct globally because of humans. And to put this into a sort of greater perspective, um, North America, um, since the rise of humans, um, has lost 72% of all mammals due to human activities. So when we say like it's influencing the biosphere, we've been doing this since day one. Woolly mammoths no longer exist because of us. Saber-toothed tigers no longer exist because of us. And this is something, again, we've been doing since day one. Now, at about 11,000 years ago, we did uh, invent farming. And this, again, might not seem like a big deal, but agriculture is, is, is huge. It's the capacity to take anything, whether it's animals or uh, um, plants, put them in a confined area and grow lots of them. Now, if you think about sort of what we did before agriculture, this is we would have to go out into nature, find stuff in nature, right? We'd have to spend time, we'd have to spend energy, we'd have to go into a dangerous area. But agriculture allows us to sit down, plant a bunch of stuff and reap the, the most out of the land as we physically can. And that's a big deal. Now, once we started doing this, we you know hunting was one thing, but once we started farming things, we dramatically changed both ecosystems and local biodiversity. So when we say biodiversity, it's kind of in its name, bio meaning life and diversity meaning how much different stuff do I have, right? So what's the diversity of life in a given area? That's what biodiversity is. It's a term we're going to hear a lot through the semester. Biodiversity is threatened. Biodiversity is changing. These are all things that we're going to hear going on. But the basic definition is how much different types of species do I have in a given area? We'll expand this definition um, in a couple class to be more encompassing. But the, at the basic level, it's what species I have in a given area. Now, ecosystems are um, sort of directly tied to our um, biodiversity. And so an ecosystem is, um, you can think of Boston Harbor itself as an ecosystem. And now what that means is Boston Harbor is comprised of species, right? Different animals and plants living there. But it also has all these conditions that are the tides, the salinity, the temperature, the pH, all these sort of non-living factors combined with the living factors to create an ecosystem. And once we started farming, we started changing ecosystems, not just through the physical farming, but by changing the area around our farms. So when we want to, say, grow more cattle, well, we burn down a forest usually, right? I'm sure you guys have all heard about the fires in Brazil. Well, part of that is because they're burning down forests so they can grow more beef, so they can grow more food. And that's a direct impact of farming. Um, in addition, uh, shortly after you know, the domestication of, of plants, so crops. Uh, we started domesticating cattle, sheep, goats, and dogs, and then eventually cats. Um, though cats are, uh, they're tricky. They're tricky guys. They're, they're domesticated, but they're kind of not. They're kind of jerks sometimes. And I say this not because I don't like cats. I had a cat for 20, 20 something years. So I like cats. Just cats are kind of jerks. <laughs> Just saying. 
Um, but once we did start domesticating things, we ultimately did start influencing what we call ecosystem processes. And what an ecosystem process is, something that an ecosystem does. And we'll discuss this topic of ecosystem processes in a few classes. But just to know that ecosystems do stuff. A forest might not look like it's doing stuff in your backyard, but um, it is always doing stuff. And you might not realize it, but it is. Uh, before we sort of move on, uh, one thing I did want to just sort of talk about is this idea of domestication, because I think it's something that we don't think about enough. Um, and so domestication as a whole has been a really, really powerful force in the rise of humans. And so the example I always like to use is corn, because it is pretty American. You know, it's from Central and South America. But, you know, we think about the eat, people eating corn. We think about it typically as in, you know, like Mexico, Canada, uh, Mexico, um, United States. And then again, everyone else eats corns, but you know it seems to be a you know a central and south uh, North American thing. Now, this is modern day corn. This is what we go if we go to Stop and Shop, we go to Shaw's, whatever. We buy corn. This is what it looks like. But there are many other different varieties of corn. We don't see these quite as often in the United States, but they're pretty common in Central and South America. And then we have the wild ancestor of corn here in the bottom left. And this wild ancestor of corn is Teosinte. And I don't know about you guys, but this doesn't look very appetizing. This looks pretty good and everything else in between looks pretty good, right? Well, this is what happens with domestication. We take a wild plant that we perceive to have some value and we select for traits that are beneficial. So getting larger, being more nutritious, being more visually appealing. So we select for all these different things. And domestication is basically taking nature and making it better for us. And so all the, all the crops we eat, you know, you can look up what wild lettuce looks like. It looks nothing like iceberg lettuce. You can look up what wild carrots look like. It looks nothing like carrots we buy at the store. And the same thing for the ancestors of our domestic animals, right? Look at the wolf compared to a dog, right? A chihuahua clearly looks not too much like a wolf, right? And so domestication is a really powerful thing. It's take, we take something simple and we make it better for us. We make it easier for us to grow. We make it give, make us more nutritious. We make it overall better for us. And we can sort of see the effects of um, domestication. So this is some data from the FDA, um, USDA. We have the time from 1860s um, all the way up to 2020, or I'm sorry, this one is um, 2012. And then we have the bushels of corn per acre. And you can see that it's pretty flat at about 25 to 30 um, for most of this time. But after the 1940s, you see the amount of bushels per acre just explode. Um, and so you can see just how domestication of corn has yielded a lot of corn originally, right? This is 20, 20 bushels of corn per acre is way more than you could get from wild corn. But you can also see that as we've improved our technology, we're increasing our yields. Um, and sort of one of the interesting things, uh, and I'd like to pose this to you guys, is around uh, 1940, so World War II era, we start to see this huge expansion. Does anybody know what happened in, uh, around World War II? You can type it into the chat or say it, one of the two. Does anyone want to take a stab at what major technology happened around World War II? Refrigeration. Refrigeration. Um, that is true. That did happen, but not the technology where that causes an expansion of bushels per acre, but that's a great, that's a great preservative thing. Is it genetic mutation? Hmm, not quite. So really meaningful genetic mutation of, of, of crops was here, but again, to get to, you know, from here to here was pretty heavy genetic mutation, but that's a great thing, genetically modifying organisms. So if you were going to grow something in your backyard, right, if you're going to try to grow some tomatoes, how would you grow your tomatoes? Fertilizer. Fertilizer, yeah. Fertilizer is the big boy here. After 19, around uh, the world, uh, world War II, a couple German scientists, um, Fritz Haber and Fran uh, Francois Bosch, I think that's his first name. And it's Haber and Bosch, they invented the modern fertilizer production process. So that happened in 1940s. And once you dump a bunch of fertilizer on crops, you just expand your capacity to grow more corn in a given area. And then along the way, we see major technological things, as we've already mentioned, you know, things like um, genetically modifying organisms. So, but the point I wanted you to all take away from this is domestication is important. Just, just think about that in terms of how human populations have grown. Right? You can think about, you get, if you can grow 25 bushels of corn, you can only feed so many people. But if I can grow 160 bushels of corn, I can feed way more people. So this, is, this idea of domestication, uh, domestication 
domestication. <laughs> I can't say words today. Uh, it was really important in the rise of humans. It's a technology at the end of the day. Um, but before, um, sort of along the way of domesticating animals, the Industrial Revolution was a major turning point in the surge of the human population. And I'm sure you guys all remember from history um, at some point, 1700s, we transitioned from manual labor, so humans or, or, um, or animals plowing fields and humans doing stuff with their hands to mechanical things, using fossil fuels, principally coal and oil, to power ourselves. And once the Industrial Revolution took off, um, it was a major sort of turning point. And it's a turning point for a couple of different reasons. One, it allowed people to move away from being, you know, just I'm going to have to just grow food and that's it, to doing other things, right? Like science and math and all sorts of other technology related things, or even, um, you know, things like art, right? So it, it sort of moved people away, allowed people to do more. But importantly, moving from hand labor to mechanical labor means you can produce more. And if you can produce more, well, you can potentially make more money or you could potentially feed more people or give more people clothes, which allows for the population to expand. And so we can see this directly looking at human populations. So we can look at 1800, there was about a billion people. By 2011, we had 7 billion people. And we project going into the future, by 2050, we'll have about 9 billion people. And you can sort of see this, right? We have this graph here, we have all these different time frames of, of sort of human population. Um, you know, this is one, one AD and then this is the, you know, BC and this is AD. But you can see that by the time we're sort of getting past a thousand, we're getting into the, um, you know, 1700s, that's when you start to see the human population really, really explode. Again, partially due to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, fun fact, this little dip, uh, that's the bubonic plague. <laughs> which is, I, I always like to point that out. Um, mostly, and it's actually pretty relevant because the, the plague seems to be coming back. So I, as a microbiologist, I should tell you, you shouldn't really worry. It's pretty readily treated by antibiotics that they clearly didn't have back then. Um, but ultimately, human population is growing. And we're going to talk about this um, in the coming weeks about when we do our uh, human demography class and how populations grow and stuff like that. But just to note that this expansion from 1800 to 2011, most of it happened in the 19, I'm sorry, in the 20th century. So you, know, you can look at between 1950 and 1990, you see like a 2 billion growth in population in a very short period of time. So again, all the technology domestication really allows human populations to grow and grow very, very rapidly. Um, and this um, sort of one of the interesting things about population size and this sort of estimate of 2050 of 9 billion people ties back to this idea of carrying capacity. And this is uh, carrying capacity refers to the population size that an area can support indefinitely. So how much resources do you have in a given area to support your population? Now, some people argue that humans have already exceeded our carrying capacity and all the, the only thing that's sort of keeping us around is all our technology that and a lot of people living in under in poverty and, and being malnourished but so some people do argue we've already overshot the carrying capacity of the planet at least for humans um, but some argue we can still recover we can still get bigger and bigger um, but at this point in time it seems like our carrying capacity will be about nine billion people though recently they've um, revised this figure to be about uh, eight billion um, because of um, not just climate change, but also, you know, socioeconomic factors like, you know, the concentration of wealth in the, in the ultra wealthy and stuff like that. So um, what the carrying capacity of the planet is for humans is really unknown at this point, but it seems to be a maximum of about 9 billion, likely about 8 billion at the end of the day. So we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll definitely reach this carrying capacity in all of our lifetimes. Um, and it will certainly be an interesting year of 2050, to say the least. But as I mentioned, carrying capacity relates directly to resources. Anything that lives in any area needs resources, whether it's land, whether it's food, whether it's mates. I mean, in the case of humans, we also have non-renewable resources like coal, oil, gas, petroleum, right? And so every, there is a limited number of resources um, on this planet. There's just a finite amount. That's just the way it is. Some resources are renewable, like plant and animal matter, but... Some are not, and that this includes our fossil fuels that we so heavily rely on. Um, just as sort of a, a byproduct of, 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 of a shared resources, they're typically, um, especially for humans, 
are used to maximize an individual's best interest. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we all went to the dining hall at Bentley, I, if I was to go there, I'd go there and eat all the pizza because that maximizes my best interest because I love pizza. Now that in the process of me eating all the pizza, um, that resource becomes overused, damaged, and potentially there's no pizza for the rest of the day for you guys. That's what we're talking about here. A shared resource is typically overused by an individual. And when we have this idea of overusing a resource, this is what we call tragedy of the commons, where we prioritize individual profits on the short term, ignoring any long term issues. Um, and this long term issues we typically see as being as a collective failure of most of, of sort of a population. And this is sort of an intrinsic property of not just humans, animals will do this too, but they are much more um, readily kept in check than humans are. But this is also sort of a byproduct of our, our economic systems as well, right? This is, this is what capitalism does, right? You prioritize short-term gains at the expense of long-term gains. You exploit your resource to make as much money as you can. And tragedy of the commons is a human thing and a natural thing, but it's also an economic thing as well. So just to sort of keep that in mind, because we're going to talk about how money relates to all this stuff throughout the course. But tragedy of the commons, again, does also sort of go hand in hand with capitalism as an economic system as well. So the question you can ask yourself is how long before the costs outweigh the benefits? How long can you keep taking and taking and taking before that resource becomes collectively, collectively a failure? Now, we're going to discuss this um, um, in the case of the passenger pigeon, which is this uh, pretty bird over here on the right. Um, Fun fact about pigeons is that there are many different species of pigeons out there, but they are very, very closely related to doves. In fact, the pigeons we see in cities are actually just doves that have just adapted to living in the city. So just a, just a fun fact. If you ever think pigeons are gross, um, they're just doves, but they're just adapting to live in cities. So we're going to discuss the passenger pigeon um, just to sort of show you what tragedy of the commons looks like when humans are sort of perpetuating this idea onto nature. So I like to always start with this quote when I talk about the passenger pigeon. And this is from a, a gentleman in the 1850s from Ohio. Um, no idea who he is. Um, neither did Wikipedia, which is where this picture is from. But this gentleman said, as the watchers stared, the hum increased to a mighty throbbing. Now everyone was out of their houses and stores looking apprehensively at the growing cloud, which was blotting out the ray of, rays of sun. Children screamed and ran for home. Women gathered their long skirts and hurried for the shelter of stores. Horses bolted. A few people mumbled frightened words about the approach of the millennium and several dropped onto their knees and prayed. Now, this easily could have been something you could think of like a passage of the Bible, right? You know, a swarm of locusts blotting out the sun. And it's not. What it is, is just a natural event. And the natural event, as you can see from this picture, is just a monster swarm or a monster flock of our passenger pigeons. And I like this quote because it just illustrates how prevalent passenger pigeons used to be. And I say used to be is because now they're extinct. This is a species of birds that we as humans have driven to extinction. Now, passenger pigeons are not very exciting of birds. Um, um, they don't, you know, they don't do cool dances or have pretty colors or anything like that, but they are useful and they're useful to humans because we eat their meat, or at least we used to eat their meat and we used to use their feathers for stuffing pillows and any other parts of their body for various activities. Now, uh, we have two pictures here of people hunting passenger pigeons. One is called a hunt and the other one is called a slaughter. And I think that is um, pretty accurate where we have four gentlemen here on the left that have killed, you know, 50 to 100 passenger pigeons for their own use, I'm assuming. Um, that's a reasonable amount of pigeons, right? That's in direct contrast to the slaughter, which, which always gets me because this, this, this is such a human thing, right? You slaughter hundreds of thousands of pigeons and then you go take a picture standing on top of them. Like it's just a giant snow hill, you know? Such a, such a, <laughs> such a silly thing to do, but I think it illustrates the point that, you know, we have people here over harvesting a resource. And then we have people here sustainably harvesting a resource. Because I think it's pretty clear that if I harvest a mountain of pigeons, that's not a sustainable way to do things. But if I harvest a reasonable amount, that's a much more sustainable way to do it. Now you can imagine also, if you think about this economically speaking, these gentlemen harvest these pigeons, they're gonna sell them, they're gonna use them, they're gonna get the capacity, some monetary value out of them. 
And the monetary value here is clearly less than the monetary value here. Though you could argue like maybe if you oversaturate the market with pigeons, it's a bad thing, but, but clearly this is more valuable than this. And this is what tragedy of the commons looks like when humans step in. We take a resource, we exploit it to the max. And I use the passenger pigeons. We could have easily done this with many, many other species. Um, so I know some of you are from the coast. Uh, if you like if you like oysters and mussels and stuff like that, there's um, historical pictures of people harvesting monstrous piles of oysters or clams and stuff like that, very much like this. Um, so this is not just unique to the passenger pigeon. This is something that we do with a lot of species, um, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, and this just doesn't happen now. Uh, this doesn't happen historically. It also happens now. You could think of this exact same picture, but like with a fisherman, right? A small fisherman versus a commercial fishing operation, right? So taking more than we probably should. And the question we could ask is, okay, so what? Passenger pigeons are extinct. The world seems to be going fine. Nature seems to be doing well. Um, there doesn't seem to be any consequences from the passenger pigeon leaving. Well, that's not really something we know, right? We know what the world looks like now, but we don't know, we have no baseline to compare it from, right? We don't have any science that says the world is exactly the same as it was before the passenger pigeon. But what we do know is that passenger pigeons likely played a pretty big role in the health and maintenance of North American forests. So you can imagine if you have a giant flock of them and they're flying through a forest, well, they're gonna land on these trees and what they're gonna do is they're gonna disturb that forest. Um, they're going to roost in trees, they're going to break old branches, they're going to kill old trees. And all this is, might seem like a bad thing, but that's a good thing. Getting rid of old dead stuff allows those um, resources to be recycled, it allows new things to grow up, allows more biodiversity to pop up. So we think passenger pigeons, because of their monster swarms, would come into areas, disturb the forests, poop everywhere, and by pooping everywhere, this fueled the growth of plant and adding nutrients. Uh, they were f food for predators. Um, you could think of something like a, like a fisher or, or even something like a, you know, potentially like a bear feeding upon these. Um, but by killing off everything, they allowed these forests to regenerate, allow dead things to go away, new things to pop up, and the forest to essentially come in and be brand new again. And that's an important thing. Getting rid of dead stuff, getting things recycled back thing is a very important thing. If we were meeting in person, we would do a lab on earthworms um, and how important earthworms are, but earthworms do the same thing. They recycle dead things back into nature. And recycling is an important thing for nature. But the idea is we have some major canopy disturbance event by our pigeons. It kills off some trees and forest regeneration begins. And as the forest begins to regenerate, more species come in, whether it's insects or birds or mammals. It allows things to come in and allows the forest to regenerate itself. And this is what the passenger pigeons were likely were doing. Um, and again, I said they were doing is because these are extinct animals. But so the point of this sort of little story is... Um, not that passenger divisions are important, but they, they clearly were, um, which is how humans can over uh, harvest a resource and potentially change the way an entire continent works. And that, that's, that's the tragedy of the commons, taking too much, not sustainably enough, and changing things irreparably. And uh, just as a sort of a final note on the passenger pigeon, uh, there is a revive and restore project um, from the passenger pigeon. And so uh, this is, uh, um, I forget what group of scientists is doing this, um, but they're, they're taking genomes, uh, uh, genetic sequences from museum birds and they're reverse genetic engineering the domesticated rock pigeon to try to bring back the passenger pigeon back to life. So they're doing some like Jurassic Park stuff. <laughs> So like they're taking DNA, they're manipulating it to try to bring something back from extinction, very much kind of like Jurassic Park did. Um, this was, they did start this in fall of 2017. I haven't checked up on it in a while because I, th I think it sort of stalled for a while, but this was a thing at one point, just, just as a note. Um, but the sort of the, the, the case of the passenger pigeon should should, should you know, the, the, the idea of how it's the tragedy of the common should be relatively clear, but the question is, why do we care? And we sort of talked about that, but you know, how does it affect humans, right? We clearly can't harvest passenger pigeons and it clearly is changing the ecosystems, but how does it directly affect us? And well, the really reality is that we don't quite know. We don't know how the extinction of one species 
affects us. And that's, that's, um, that's not the most important part of a species extinction at the end of the day, right? So when we think about how something is gonna affect us, we like to think of this as an anthropocentric worldview, only how it affects humans matters. Um, so that's the anthropocentric worldview. But when we're thinking about how the passenger pigeon affected the, the environment, well, we're starting to think in a different way. So we're thinking both in a biocentric worldview, which is every organisms has the right to exist regardless of its benefit to humans. So even if it doesn't have any benefits, everything has the right to exist. And that's a biocentric view. And that's in contrast to an ecocentric view. The entire ecosystem, including pigeons and humans, matters. So every living thing matters. And again, everything is connected. We like to think of ourselves as separate from nature, but we are bound to nature. And I think Climate change is going to definitely show us how we're bound to nature, but COVID shows us how we're bound to nature as well, right? We're not separate from nature. Treating nature so badly is what leads to pandemics like this. Now, when we're thinking about the sort of the title of the course, right, it's a sustainability course. Um, and sustainability is a pretty hot topic right now. How do we do things more sustainable? I watch um, most of my television on Hulu. I see ads for sustainable fashion. I see ads for sustainable mattresses. I see ads for sustainable anything. Uh, you can even like look at a big brand like Chipotle, right? They're sustainable, right? They, they, try, they try to be sustainable as they can. So it's a kind of a hot topic now. Um, but ultimately, sustainability is all about keeping a more of a biocentric or an ecocentric worldview, less on the human-focused worldview, and ensuring that all the resources will be available indefinitely. Now, we think about the slaughter of the passenger pigeons. That was clearly not sustainable, right? We harvested and harvested and harvested. Tragedy of the commons at play. And we over-harvested them to extinction. And so when we're thinking about this idea, and we're trying to think about sustainability, ultimately we're trying to keeping a, a, our ecosystems more resilient, making sure that they have the capacity to maintain the resources that we need them to do. So if we need an ecosystem to provide us with timber or they need the timber for the ecosystem to work, well, we need to think about sustainably, how do we take away from that ecosystem? That's what sustainability is. And it could be as simple as simply maintaining um, biodiversity or um, something as simple like saving a species. And then just as a note before I answer your question, Ben, uh, in 2015, the UN did designate sustainable development goals as it's one of its top priorities, in particular to end poverty, as well as to set goals for sustainable economic development. Because the pace we're at right now, what we did to the passenger pigeon is not something we can do really going forward. So, but to answer your question, Ben, um, we think about sustainability. When we think about how treating the environment matters, there's been a lot of research that shows as you degrade the environment, the more likely you are to be act in, exposed to the environment. So you'll drive essentially animals um, in one of two ways. You'll either lead to the proliferation of, pet, of pests, so like uh, mice, rats, um, rabbits, things that are in constant contact with humans. So you lead to the proliferation of those by destroying ecosystems. But you also move the wild closer to you. Because again, you're destroying nature, it pushes them closer to you. By doing that, by having more pests and more greater exposure to animals, the more likely you are for a disease to jump from nature to us. And we see this all the time. We can look at the most relevant case right now, which is COVID, right? COVID jumped from bat to human. And that's because of nature being in contact with humans, right? And this, the, the, the idea here with this was bushmeat, right? Or uh, potentially exposure to feces, right? Nature was a, uh, essentially with humans in a way it, it probably shouldn't have been. Um, but you can also look at major historical diseases. HIV came about the very same way, exposure to primates. Again, humans being too close to nature. You can look at measles, same way. Major diseases jump from nature to us. And so as we destroy nature, as we put ourselves closer to nature, as we increase the amount of pests, because again, there's not a lot of natural habitat left, we're more likely to see more diseases coming forward. And just a sort of unfortunate reality of it. Um, diseases are a natural part of humans, but how we treat nature is not the best thing. And we'll, as we'll talk about with climate change, as we, how we handle climate change will also be an important way to think about how diseases are gonna proliferate in a warmer world as well. Not just human diseases, but also you know, zoonotic diseases. So diseases that are killing animals. 
there was a nice big article about um, this idea that would explain it much more uh, in depth than I just did. But so if anyone wants that article, please let me know. I'll be happy to send it out to the class um, about it. It's a really an important thing. Um, we don't, you know, there is direct effects here, right? You know, COVID is a direct effect of this. Um, but again, over harvesting resources, again, direct effect of not harvesting things sustainably. Because again, it's a finite amount of resources on this planet. And until we colonize another planet, this is all we got. And even if we colonize Mars, there's still a limited amount of resources on Mars as well, right? So. Um, and so the last part of our lecture will be focused on scientific literacy. And um, you're going to be reading a bunch of articles, and we're going to be talking about a bunch of science. Um, because everything in this class is, is grounded in science. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. Everything that I'm telling you in this class is grounded in science. There is, you can, anything I tell you, you can go up and you can look at scientific literature and you'll find the ideas that I'm talking about. So, um, but to understand why I, I can confidently go pull stuff from the scientific literature and then present it to you as, maybe not as a fact, but as a, a high, with a high degree of certainty is because of the scientific process. And so we need to sort of think about sort of the underlying mechanism of, of that. And to get at that, we need to think about scientific literacy. And the more and more I teach, I've been teaching for about a decade now at the collegiate level. Um, and the more and more as time passes, um, uh, the more and more this lecture become, this part of this lecture becomes more and more um, uh, relevant. And you can see this even with, um, you know, in modern times, right? You can see, you know, people thinking, oh, drinking bleach is going to cure me of disease. Well, if you had better scientific literacy, you, and probably common sense, you would know not to drink bleach, right? Uh, so this being um, literate scientifically and being able to understand science is an important thing, not only for you as a student, but also for you as a person in, you know, the outside world. So scientific literacy really starts with um, understanding the underlying mechanisms of science. You recognize a problem, you collect data, you propose a hypothesis, and then you test that hypothesis. Now, a scientific hypothesis is simply uh, a well-framed statement about an idea. So I hypothesized. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, we have um, my cell phone won't work. I collect my data, and then my hypothesis is my cell phone does not work because there is no service. And then I test my hypothesis. But that's all hypothesis is. It's a well-stated um, question about a problem. Um, as a hypothesis gains more and more traction, as it gets more and more supporting evidence and less and less contradictory data, it's then moved up to what we call a scientific theory. And now a scientific theory is kind of a big deal in the world of science. And so a couple examples of this include plate tectonics, so how the, the land, the, the, the physical land and, and, and the ocean too, sits on top of tectonic plates and they move, right? That's pretty common knowledge, but that's a scientific theory still. Evolution, again, another scientific theory. But what keeps these uh, as theories is because they um, have a large, large pool of evidence behind them and very, very little contradictory data. And again, that's in contrast to sort of average everyday speak, where I theorize that cats are the devil or, or cats are evil because they like to knock cups off my table, right? I mean, cats are totally evil because they like to knock cups off the table, but that's, you know, theory in terms of average everyday life is very, very different than theory in scientific terms. Just as a, just as a note, you know, people like to harp on evolution because it's a theory. Well, scientifically speaking, a theory is a big deal. So um, in terms of um, the scientific method, here's a sort of a, you know, a, a diagram that you can look at, but I'll just walk you through a much, uh, a much uh, more visually pleasing diagram. Um, and it's led by uh, Philip J. Fry, who's the star of my favorite TV show, Futurama. Um, if you haven't watched Futurama, it's a fantastic show. Now, it all starts with some sort of observation. Um, you move then into a question. Um, once you have that question, you formulate your hypothesis. Again, hypothesis being just a well-stated question that you can test. From your hypothesis, you can make some sort of overall prediction. You do some experiment, whether it's just observing nature or actually physically manipulating something, which gives you some results. And once you have your results, you either reject your hypothesis and you go back to the drawing board and you repeat this process over and over again until you can confirm your hypothesis. And as you do more and more experiments, you generate more and more data, you then start crafting a theory and then the process repeats itself. The beautiful thing about science is there's always more questions to be asked. So even if we you know, find the cure a vaccine for COVID, there's always gonna be a million and one more tests 
and million and one more ideas about COVID that we're going to have to try to answer. So that's the cool thing about science. It's always iterative. Um, and as I mentioned, you can do sort of two different types of science. There's observational and experimental science. Observational is just collecting data on the real world without manipulating anything. So I just want to study the behavior of sharks naturally. That's an observational study. That's in contrast to an experimental study where you intentionally manipulate something. And that can be either in the lab, the field, or the environment. I'm sorry, um, not the environment, the, like a hospital setting. Um, and, you know, example of this is like, I want to know the efficacy of this drug for the treatment of HIV. Well, I have an experiment where I give one group my drug and another group a placebo. That's what an experimental study is. And then ultimately, you publish these in what's called a peer-reviewed journal. And when you hear peer-reviewed, it typically means, well, it doesn't typically mean, it means that they're reviewed by an expert in the field. So in this case, um, we have two papers from, a, um, from some folks at, from, at Bentley. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stoner is the, my colleague who actually teaches the other um, section of this course. She works on marine stuff, but these are two of her articles. One's, a, ex, one's an observational, one's an experimental one. And um, they're published in the Journal of Marine Pollution and the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology. These are peer reviewed, meaning that people that were as knowledgeable or more knowledgeable than Dr. Stoner here reviewed these for their scientific rigor. And scientific articles are the primary means by which we disseminate information. So anytime you see like a, a news article that's been picked up by like CNN or the Washington Post or any major periodical, and it says in a new study published in X journal, that's a scientific article. And again, scientific articles are um, the primary way by which um, information is, is disseminated, but it's also, they're very rigorous. So if you have a good journal, the science that published in there is sound. It's not garbage science. Um, in terms of science, it's typically funded via government information. Uh, I'm sorry, government, um, government funds. So your tax dollars. Um, these include the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the CDC, the FDA, you know, NOAA, all sorts of scientific agencies here in the United States, as well as in Europe and China. And every country has their own scientifically funded um, government agencies. Um, so government funding is your tax dollars. And that's in contrast to private funding, which is something that's funded by a company. So like, you know, you think of something like AstraZeneca funding a study, or you can think of an investor. You have, you know, like a startup company. Um, they have some cool idea and you have investors funding it because they want to generate a profit. Um, so that's how science is funded. Um, journals as a whole have tiers. And so tiers can be assessed by this. Um, you may or may not have heard this before, uh, depending on how much primary reading you've done in your academic career thus far, but journals can be judged by their impact factor. Uh, if you want to know more about the impact factor, uh, this Wikipedia article will tell you all you need to know. It basically refers to uh, how good a journal is, in a sense. So um, higher impact factors um, mean you have a better journal. Um, there, there's issues with this, but just as a general rule, it's a pretty good way. Um, and as I mentioned, higher impact factors are better journals. But on the flip side of that, there is predatory journals. And every major library across the country has a guide about predatory journals. So this one is from Yale. Um, and predatory journals are exactly what you think. People trying to scam uh, people or trying to make money off science. And by doing this, they publish garbage sciences, science. So people pay them to publish things. They get a nice little line on their CV that says, hey, I published this in this journal, but it's actually not a good journal. And so when you're anytime you're like sort of trying to evaluate science and maybe not science too, but maybe you want to evaluate an economic thing or a model or a data analysis tool, you always sort of try to look at this idea of these predatory journals as well as what the quality of the journal is. Now, the bottom line here is, um, is well, two things. Uh, first, because it's published in a journal, it doesn't mean it's perfect. Um, you know, some studies are limited. And we'll talk about that sort of aspect of not being perfect. But again, some, some journals are bad and some journals are just not that good. But ultimately, you always interpret individual scientific findings with caution. Now, a good example of this is um, all the, the hua that was made about hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. There was one journal that published an article. But after that article came out, there was about 12 or 13 that came out with the exact opposite result. So that one article about hydroxychloroquine being good relative to the, the 13 others that said it was not good, 
you know, you have to take that one article with relation to the rest of the field, right? And so it's important to always interpret science with caution and understanding what journal it's publishing is a good thing as well. Um, but overall, science as a whole protects itself. Now, it's kind of a good thing. Um, and science protects itself um, just by the way it's done. So the way, you know, that the scientific method that we work through, that protects itself. Um, but science protects itself also with good experimental design and statistics. Now, this is, comes in the form of large data sets. So if I wanted to say, find out the average height of students at Bentley, well, I could take the height of everyone in this class and, and try to make some assumption based upon the height of everyone in this class and the average height of people at Bentley. Or I could just increase my data set to be the entire student population at Bentley. And now I have a much more robust data set. So large data sets allow you to be more confident in your answer. Um, replication is important too. Um, so life as a whole is not static, it's not uniform, and you have to account for that. So the, the, the efficacy of say, uh, you know, fertilizer might not be uniform between the desert and the tropical rainforest on plant growth, right? So you have to account for that. You also have to account that things change through time. So it's an important factor. Um, proper controls are important. So what's happening in the absence of your treatment? In the hydroxychloroquine example, uh, the study that said it was good did not have the actual the best control things. Um, so if I'm trying to understand the effects of hydroxychloroquine. I need a good control group where I don't have any patients getting hydroxychloroquine. And then finally, the appropriate math is important. Science and math are linked together. They're best friends. So do you have the right data set to use the mathematical model or tests or statistics that you're trying to use? And you have enough data to draw the conclusions you're trying to draw. And the data refers back to, again, the size of your data sets and how well you replicate and how well you control it. It's an important part. Um, and math is, again, a really important part. And um, uh, you guys are probably all familiar with math, you know, economics and data analysis and all the majors at Bentley has, math is a big part of this. Uh, but an important sort of feature of math, and especially for science, is that just because two variables are correlated does not mean they cause one another. Now, I could, you can find any number of things that are correlated, but they actually aren't related with one another. And so to get around this, you, bigger sample sizes and looking temporally through, through, so through time is very important to suss this out. Now, just to sort of show you what I mean by this, we have um, in red the number of swimming pool drownings, time is on the x-axis, and then we have the number of Nicolas Cage films on the other y-axis in black. And so you can see that there is a correlation, that whenever Nicolas Cage releases a lot of movies, there's typically a, co uh, a concurrent spike of people drowning to death. And the correlation here is, is pretty good. It's a 66, you know, the, the R value is, is 66, right? 0.66. It's pretty good. This is what we would call a spurious correlation. They're related, there's a correlation, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're related. Um, and this is, uh, if, you got, if you wanna know where this is from, this is the website, it's from a website called Spurious Correlations. It's a really fun website if you have, well, you could do it in 10 minutes, but you could dive easily hours into this website. It's really fun, all sorts of crazy correlations. This one is just one of my favorites. <laughs> um, but you know, the important thing is here, just because two things are correlated, doesn't mean there's a meaningful scientific relationship between them. So if I, you know, again, Nicolas Cage, just because he's producing films doesn't mean that's causing people to drown to death. They're not related, they're correlated, but they're not really related. And that's an important thing, especially when you start to sort of read articles written by journalists, that they get tripped up with this idea a lot. You know, giving someone a medication correlates with them getting better, but is it the actual cause? Well, that's, um, that's up for debate. Um, and there's, a, there's some stuff about math here. Uh, math is necessary to sort of suss out the difference. So um, math is important um, overall for science and, and other fields too, but in particular for, for science. Um, and sort of the last sort of uh, thing is uh, not all science is good. Uh, so not all scientists and people who fund science publish legitimate data or are ethical. And it's just a sort of a human thing, right? No matter what field you go in, you're gonna get people that are unethical. You're gonna get people that do things that are not particularly very good. And that's just the humans, right? That's just, people are just kind of jerks. <laughs> um, and there's lots of reasons behind this, both monetary and political reasons. So people get paid to find the correct answer. It's not all that uncommon, um, unfortunately. Some people like to cherry pick data or suppress some data. This is a big one in climate change, and we'll talk about this later in the semester. So people will choose a subsection of a data set that shows their pattern, ignoring the rest of the very large data set. 
Um, we have people that are doing poor ex experiments or poor use of statistics. Predatory journals also publish garbage stuff too. Uh, sloppy or rush work and then small sample sizes. If you're trying to draw a meaningful conclusion, you need a big sample size. Now, some of these are intentional, right? Suppressing data and taking money to find the answer, clearly intentional, but sometimes science is, you know, doesn't protect itself. It should, but not always does it, right? So you can have a poor ex experimental design because you're not knowledgeable enough and that produces bad science. So it's a combination of being um, not so good with ethically and being not so good as a scientist. But ultimately this is a bad thing. It results in poor policies. It results in poor decisions. It results in poor use of money. So if you publish fraudulent science that shows something and then you invest billions of dollars into it, well, you potentially could have just wasted billions of dollars. And the other thing that science does is it has these real world consequences of causing deaths. And when science is bad, people can die. And the sort of the best example I can give you of this is the, um, the information, the, the, the poor science that was done in this specific article. So this is from 1998, the journal's The Lancet. Um, if you wanna read up about it here, um, but this is um, the article that kicked off the anti-vaccination movement. It was a very poorly designed article, like a, a poorly designed scientific study. There's all sorts of ethical issues and funding issues. But this kicked off a huge movement, which has caused millions of people not to get vaccinated, which has killed thousands and thousands of people, and it's going to kill thousands of people going forward. Um, and so you can see how this article, again, if you want to just sort of read these sort of general articles, it's a good way to sort of get the gist of why this article is bad. But again, bad science, poor ethics, you know, shady funding led to this, which has kicked off a whole fraudulent movement. So. The point of this whole part was to show you that science can show you really powerful things. The things we talked about earlier in this class, the things we're going to talk about, good science behind them. Bad science can produce some really bad things. And again, including people dying. So that's going to be the end of our lecture. I'm going to end with this picture of my dogs I took this morning because this was pretty cute. They've never done this before. So I figured I'd share this picture of my dogs as a way to end the class. Um, but if you guys have any questions about what you heard, um, please let me know. I will hang around for a bit. Um, if you have any questions at all about any things we've talked about, please let me know. Um, but again, if you haven't dropped a hello to me in the chat, please make sure you do so that you can get your credit for coming to class today. But otherwise, I will see you guys next Thursday. And I hope you guys enjoy your long weekend. Though we just got off summer break, so I guess, you know, the long week, it's not as exciting as three months off. But I digress. Thanks, Professor. Have a good one. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.